Moby Dick, chapters 89 to 91. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Stuart Wills. Moby Dick by Herman Melville, chapters 89 to 91. Chapter 89 fast fish and loose fish. The allusion to the waif and waif poles in the last chapter but one necessitates some account of the laws and regulations of the whale fishery, of which the waif may be deemed the grand symbol and badge. It frequently happens that when several ships are cruising in company, a whale may be struck by one vessel, then escape and be finally killed and captured by another vessel and herein are indirectly comprised many minor contingencies, all partaking of this one grand feature. For example, after a weary and perilous chase and capture of a whale, the body may get loose from the ship by reason of a violent storm, and, drifting far away to leeward, be retaken by a second whaler, who, in a calm, snugly tows it alongside, without risk of life or line, Thus the most vexatious and violent disputes would often arise between the fishermen, were there not some written or unwritten, universal, undisputed law applicable to all cases. Perhaps the only formal whaling code authorized by legislative enactment was that of Holland. It was decreed by the States General in A.D. 1695. But though no other nation has ever had any written whaling law, Yet the American fishermen have been their own legislators and lawyers in this matter. They have provided a system which for terse comprehensiveness surpasses Justinian's Pandex and the bylaws of the Chinese society for the suppression of meddling with other people's business. Yes, the laws might be engraven on a Queen Anne's farthing, or the barb of a harpoon, and worn round the neck, so small are they. 1. A fast fish belongs to the party fast to it. 2. A loose fish is fair game for anybody who can soonest catch it. But what plays the mischief with this masterly code is the admirable brevity of it, which necessitates a vast volume of commentaries to expound it. First, what is a fast fish? Alive or dead, a fish is technically fast when it is connected with an occupied ship or boat, by any medium at all controllable by the occupant or occupants, a mast, an oar, a nine-inch cable, a telegraph wire, or a strand of cobweb, it is all the same. Likewise, a fish is technically fast when it bears a waif, or any other recognized symbol of possession so long as the party wafing it plainly evince their ability at any time to take it alongside, as well as their intention to do so. These are scientific commentaries, but the commentaries of the whalemen themselves sometimes consist in hard words and harder knocks, the Cocopon Littleton of the fist. True, among the more upright and honorable whalemen, allowances are always made for particular cases, where it would be an outrageous moral injustice for one party to claim possession of a whale previously chased or killed by another party. But others are by no means so scrupulous. Some fifty years ago there was a curious case of a whale trover litigated in England, wherein the plaintiffs set forth that after a hard chase of a whale in the northern seas, and when indeed they, the plaintiffs, had succeeded in harpooning the fish, they were at last, through peril of their lives, obliged to forsake not only their lines, but their boat itself. Ultimately the defendants, the crew of another ship, came up with the whale, struck, killed, seized, and finally appropriated it before the very eyes of the plaintiffs. And when those defendants were remonstrated with, their captain snapped his fingers in the plaintiff's teeth, and assured them that by way of doxology to the deed he had done, he would now retain their line, harpoons, and boat, which had remained attached to the whale at the time of the seizure. Wherefore the plaintiffs now sued for the recovery of the value of their whale, line, harpoons, and boat. 
Mr. Erskine was counsel for the defendants, Lord Ellenborough was the judge. In the course of the defense, the witty Erskine went on to illustrate his position by alluding to a recent Crim Con case, wherein a gentleman, after in vain trying to bridle his wife's viciousness, had at last abandoned her upon the seas of life, but in the course of years, repenting of that step, he instituted an action to recover possession of her. Erskine was on the other side, and he then supported it by saying that though the gentleman had originally harpooned the lady, and had once had her fast, and only by reason of the great stress of her plunging viciousness had at last abandoned her, yet abandon her he did, so that she became a loose fish, and therefore when a subsequent gentleman re-harpooned her, the lady then became that subsequent gentleman's property, along with whatever harpoon might have been found sticking in her. Now in the present case Erskine contended that the examples of the whale and the lady were reciprocally illustrative of each other. These pleadings and the counter-pleadings being duly heard, the very learned judge in set terms decided, to wit, that as for the boat he awarded it to the plaintiffs, because they had merely abandoned it to save their lives, but that with regard to the controverted whale, harpoons, and line, they belonged to the defendants, the whale because it was a loose fish at the time of the final capture, and the harpoons and line, because when the fish made off with them, it, the fish, acquired a property in those articles, and hence anybody who afterwards took the fish had a right to them. Now the defendants afterwards took the fish, ergo the aforesaid articles were theirs. A common man, looking at this decision of the very learned judge, might possibly object to it but ploughed up to the primary rock of the matter, the two great principles laid down in the twin whaling laws previously quoted, and applied and elucidated by Lord Ellenborough in the above-cited case, these two laws touching fast fish and loose fish, I say, will, on reflection, be found the fundamentals of all human jurisprudence, for notwithstanding its complicated tracery of sculpture, the temple of the law, like the temple of the Philistines, has but two props to stand on. Is it not a saying in everyone's mouth, possession is half of the law, that is, regardless of how the thing came into possession? But often possession is the whole of the law. What are the sinews and souls of Russian serfs and Republican slaves but fast fish, whereof possession is the whole of the law? What to the rapacious landlord is the widow's last mite but a fast fish? What is yonder undetected villain's marble mansion with a door-plate for a waif? What is that but a fast fish? What is the ruinous discount which Mordecai the broker gets from poor Wobegon the bankrupt, on a loan to keep Wobegon's family from starvation? What is that ruinous discount but a fast fish? What is the Archbishop of Save Souls' income of one hundred thousand pounds, seized from the scant bread and cheese of hundreds of thousands of broken-backed labourers, all sure of heaven without any of Save Souls' help? What is that globular one hundred thousand pounds but a fast fish? What are the Duke of Dunder's hereditary towns and hamlets but fast fish? What to that redoubted harpooner John Bull is poor Ireland, but a fast fish? What to that apostolic lancer, brother Jonathan, is Texas but a fast fish? And concerning all these, is not possession the whole of the law? But if the doctrine of fast fish be pretty generally applicable, the kindred doctrine of loose fish is still more widely so. That is internationally and universally applicable. What was America in 1492 but a loose fish, in which Columbus struck the Spanish standard by way of wafing it for his royal master and mistress? What was Poland to the Tsar? What Greece to the Turk? What India to England? What at last will Mexico be to the United States? All loose fish. What are the rights of man and the liberties of the world but loose fish? What all men's minds and opinions but loose fish? What is the principle of religious belief in them but a loose fish? 
what to the ostentatious smuggling verbalists are the thoughts of thinkers but loose fish what is the great globe itself but a loose fish and what are you reader but a loose fish and a fast fish too chapter ninety heads or tails de baleno vero sufficit si rex habiet caput et regina caudam bracton l three c three latin from the books of the laws of england which taken along with the context means that of all whales captured by anybody on the coast of that land the king as honorary grand harpooner must have the head and the queen be respectfully presented with the tail a division which in the whale is much like having an apple there is no intermediate remainder now as this law under a modified form is to this day in force in england and as it offers in various respects a strange anomaly touching the general law of fast and loosed fish it is here treated of in a separate chapter on the same courteous principle that prompts the english railways to be at the expense of a separate car specially reserved for the accommodation of royalty in the first place in curious proof of the fact that the above-mentioned law is still in force i proceed to lay before you a circumstance that happened within the last two years it seems that some honest mariners of dover or sandwich or some one of the sink ports had after a hard chase succeeded in killing and beaching a fine whale which they had originally described afar off from the shore now the sink ports are partially or somehow under the jurisdiction of a sort of policeman or beadle called a lord warden holding the office directly from the crown i believe all the royal emoluments incident to the sink port territories become by assignment his by some writers this office is called a sinecure but not so because the lord warden is busily employed at times in fobbing his perquisites which are his chiefly by virtue of that same fobbing of them now when these poor sunburnt mariners barefooted and with their trousers rolled high up on their ely legs had wearily hauled their fat fish high and dry promising themselves a good one hundred fifty pounds from the precious oil and bone and in fantasy sipping rare tea with their wives and good ale with their cronies upon the strength of their respective shares up steps a very learned and most christian and charitable gentleman with a copy of blackstone under his arm and laying it upon the whale's head he says hands off this fish my masters is a fast fish i seize it as the lord wardens upon this the poor mariners in their respectful consternation so truly english not knowing what to say fall to vigorously scratching their heads all round meanwhile ruefully glancing from the whale to the stranger but that did no wise mend the matter or at all soften the hard heart of the learned gentleman with the copy of blackstone at length one of them after long scratching about for his ideas made bold to speak please sir who is the lord warden the duke but the duke had nothing to do with taking this fish it is his we have been at great trouble and peril and some expense and is all that to go to the duke's benefit and we get nothing at all for our pains but our blisters it is his is the duke so very poor as to be forced to this desperate mode of getting a livelihood it is his i fought to relieve my old bedridden mother by part of my share of this whale it is his won't the duke be content with a quarter or a half it is his in a word the whale was seized and sold and his grace the duke of wellington received the money thinking that viewed in some particular lights this case might by a bare possibility in some small degree be deemed under the circumstances a rather hard one an honest clergyman of the town respectfully addressed a note to his grace begging him to take the case of those unfortunate mariners into full consideration to which my lord duke in substance replied 
both letters were published, that he had already done so, and received the money, and would be obliged to the reverend gentleman if for the future he, the reverend gentleman, would decline meddling with other people's business. Is this the still militant old man standing at the corners of the three kingdoms on all hands coercing alms of beggars? It will readily be seen that in this case the alleged right of the duke to the whale was a delegated one from the sovereign. We must needs inquire then on what principle the sovereign is originally invested with that right. The law itself has already been set forth, but Plowden gives us the reason for it. Says Plowden, the whale so caught belongs to the king and queen, quote, because of its superior excellence, end quote and by the soundest commentators this has ever been held a cogent argument in such matters. But why should the king have the head and the queen the tail? A reason for that, ye lawyers. In his treatise on Queen Gold, or Queen Pin Money, an old King's Bench author, one William Prynne, thus discourseth, quote, Ye tail is ye queen's, that ye queen's wardrobe may be supplied with ye whalebone. End quote. Now this was written at a time when the black limber bone of the Greenland or right whale was largely used in ladies' bodices. But this same bone is not in the tail, it is in the head, which is a sad mistake for a sagacious lawyer like Prynne. But is the queen a mermaid to be presented with a tail? An allegorical meaning may lurk here. There are two royal fish so styled by the English law writers, the whale and the sturgeon, both royal property under certain limitations, and nominally supplying the tenth branch of the crown's ordinary revenue. I know not that any other author has hinted of the matter, but by inference it seems to me that the sturgeon must be divided in the same way as the whale, the king receiving the highly dense and elastic head peculiar to that fish, which symbolically regarded may possibly be humorously grounded upon some presumed congeniality. And thus there seems a reason in all things, even in law. Chapter 91. The Pequod Meets the Rosebud. Quote, in vain it was to rake for ambergris in the paunch of this leviathan, insufferable fetter denying not inquiry. End quote. Sir T. Brown, V. E. It was a week or two after the last whaling scene recounted, and when we were slowly sailing over a sleepy, vapory, midday sea, that the many noses on the Pequod's deck proved more vigilant discoverers than the three pairs of eyes aloft, a peculiar and not very pleasant smell was smelt in the sea. "'I will bet something now,' said Stubb, "'that somewhere hereabouts are some of those drugged whales we tickled the other day. I thought they would keel up before long.' Presently the vapors in advance slid aside, and there in the distance lay a ship, whose furled sails betoken that some sort of whale must be alongside. As we glided nearer, the stranger showed French colors from his peak, and by the eddying cloud of vulture sea-fowl that circled and hovered and swooped around him, it was plain that the whale alongside must be what the fishermen call a blasted whale. That is, a whale that has died unmolested on the sea, and so floated an unappropriated corpse." It may well be conceived what an unsavory odor such a mass must exhale, worse than an Assyrian city in the plague, when the living are incompetent to bury the departed. So intolerable indeed is it regarded by some, that no cupidity could persuade them to moor alongside of it. Yet are there those who will still do it, notwithstanding the fact that the oil obtained from such subjects is of a very inferior quality, and by no means of the nature of attar of rose. Coming still nearer with the expiring breeze, we saw that the Frenchman had a second whale alongside, and this second whale seemed even more of a nosegay than the first. In truth, it turned out to be one of those problematical whales that seem to dry up and die with a sort of prodigious dyspepsia or indigestion, leaving their defunct bodies almost entirely bankrupt of anything like oil. 
Nevertheless, in its proper place, we shall see that no knowing fisherman will ever turn up his nose at such a whale as this, however much he may shun blasted whales in general. The Pequod had now swept so nigh to the stranger that Stubb vowed he recognized his cutting spade pole entangled in the lines that were knotted round the tail of one of these whales. "'There's a pretty fellow now,' he banteringly laughed, standing in the ship's bows. "'There's a jackal for thee. I well know that these crappos of Frenchmen are but poor devils in the fishery, sometimes lowering their boats for breakers, mistaking them for sperm-whale spouts.' Yes, and sometimes sailing from their ports with their hold full of boxes of tallow candles, and cases of snuffers, foreseeing that all the oil they will get won't be enough to dip the captain's wick into. Aye, we all know these things. But look ye, here's a crapo that is content with our leavings. The drugged whale there, I mean. Aye, and is content too with scraping the dry bones of that other precious fish she has there. Poor devil! I say, pass round a hat, someone, and let's make him a present of a little oil for dear charity's sake. For what oil he will get from that drugged whale there wouldn't be fit to burn in a jail. No, not in a condemned cell. And as for the other whale, why, I'll agree to get more oil by chopping up and trying out these three masts of ours than he'll get from that bundle of bones. Though now that I think of it, it may contain something worth a good deal more than oil." Yes, ambergris. I wonder now if our old man has thought of that. It's worth trying. Yes, I'm for it. And so saying, he started for the quarter-deck. By this time the faint air had become a complete calm, so that whether or no the Pequod was now fairly entrapped in the smell, with no hope of escaping except by its breezing up again. Issuing from the cabin, Stubb now called his boat's crew, and pulled off for the stranger. Drawing across her bow, he perceived that, in accordance with the fanciful French taste, the upper part of her stem-piece was carved in the likeness of a huge drooping stalk, was painted green, and for thorns had copper spikes projecting from it here and there, the whole terminating in a symmetrical folded bulb of a bright red colour, Upon her headboards, in large gilt letters, he read, Bouton de Rose, Rose Button, or Rose Bud, and this was the romantic name of this aromatic ship. Though Stubb did not understand the Bouton part of the inscription, yet the word Rose and the bulbous figurehead put together sufficiently explained the whole to him. A wooden rose bud, eh? he cried with his hand to his nose. That will do very well but how like all creation it smells! Now, in order to hold direct communication with the people on deck, he had to pull round the bows to the starboard side, and thus come close to the blasted whale, and so talk over it. Arrived then at this spot, with one hand still to his nose, he bawled, uh, Bouton de Rose, ahoy! Are there any of you uh, Bouton de Roses that speak English? Yes, rejoined a Guernsey man from the bulwarks, who turned out to be the chief mate. Well then, uh, my Bouton de Rosebud, uh, have you seen the white whale? What whale? The white whale. A sperm whale, Moby Dick. Have you seen him? Never heard of such a whale. Cachelot Blanche? White whale? No. Uh, very good, then. Uh, good-bye now, and I'll call again in a minute. Then, rapidly pulling back towards the Pequod, and seeing Ahab leaning over the quarter-deck rail, awaiting his report, he moulded his two hands into a trumpet and shouted, uh, No, sir, no! Upon which Ahab retired, and Stubb returned to the Frenchman. He now perceived that the Guernsey man, who had just got into the chains, and was using a cutting spade, had slung his nose in a sort of bag. "'What's the matter with your nose there?' said Stubb. "'Broke it?' "'I wish it were broken, or that I didn't have any nose at all,' answered the Guernsey man, who did not seem to relish the job he was at very much. "'But what are you holding yours for?' "'Oh, uh, nothing. It's a wax nose. I have to hold it on. A fine day, ain't it?' Air rather gardeny, I should say. Throw us a bunch of posies, will you, uh, Bouton de Rose? 
"'What in the devil's name do you want here?' roared the Guernseyman, flying into a sudden passion. "'Oh, uh, keep cool. Cool. Yes, that's the word. Uh, why don't you pack those whales in ice while you're working at em? But uh, joking aside, though, do you know, uh, Rosebud, that it's all nonsense trying to get any oil out of such whales? As for that dried-up one, there, he hasn't a gill in his whole carcass. I know that well enough, but do you see the captain here won't believe it. This is his first voyage. He was a cologne manufacturer before. But come aboard, and mayhap he'll believe you if he won't me, and so I'll get out of this dirty scrape. Anything to oblige you, my sweet and pleasant fellow, rejoined Stubb, and with that he soon mounted to the deck. There a queer scene presented itself. The sailors, in tasseled caps of red worsted, were getting the heavy tackles in readiness for the whales. But they worked rather slow, and talked very fast, and seemed in anything but a good humor. All their noses upwardly projected from their faces like so many jib-booms. Now and then pairs of them would drop their work, and run up to the masthead to get some fresh air. Some, thinking they would catch the plague, dipped oakum in coal-tar, and at intervals held it to their nostrils. Others, having broken the stems of their pipes almost short off at the bowl, were vigorously puffing tobacco-smoke, so that it constantly filled their olfactories. Stubb was struck by a shower of outcries and anathemas proceeding from the captain's roundhouse abaft, and looking in that direction saw a fiery face thrust from behind the door which was held ajar from within. This was the tormented surgeon, who, after in vain remonstrating against the proceedings of the day, had betaken himself to the captain's roundhouse, cabinet, he called it, to avoid the pest, but still could not help yelling out his entreaties and indignations at times. Marking all this, Stubb argued well for his scheme and turning to the Guernseyman, had a little chat with him, during which the stranger mate expressed his detestation of his captain as a conceited ignoramus, who had brought them all into so unsavory and unprofitable a pickle. Sounding him carefully, Stubb further perceived that the Guernsey man had not the slightest suspicion concerning the ambergris. He therefore held his peace on that head, but otherwise was quite frank and confidential with him, so that the two quickly concocted a little plan for both circumventing and satirizing the captain, without his at all dreaming of distrusting their sincerity. According to this little plan of theirs, the Guernsey man, under cover of an interpreter's office, was to tell the captain what he pleased, but as coming from Stubb and as for Stubb, he was to utter any nonsense that should come uppermost in him during the interview. By this time their destined victim appeared from his cabin. He was a small and dark but rather delicate-looking man for a sea-captain, with large whiskers and moustache, however, and wore a red-cotton velvet vest with watch-seals at his side. To this gentleman, Stubb was now politely introduced by the Guernsey man, who at once ostentatiously put on the aspect of interpreting between them. "'What shall I say to him first? said he. "'Why?' said Stubb, eyeing the velvet vest and watch and seals. "'You may as well begin by telling him that he looks a sort of babyish to me, though I don't pretend to be a judge.' "'He says, monsieur,' said the Guernseyman, in French, turning to his captain, that only yesterday his ship spoke a vessel whose captain and chief mate with six sailors had all died of a fever caught from a blasted whale they had brought alongside. Upon this the captain started, and eagerly desired to know more. "'What now?' said the Guernseyman to Stubb. "'Why, since he takes it so easy?' Tell him that now I have eyed him carefully, I'm quite certain that he's no more fit to command a whale-ship than a St. Jago monkey. In fact, tell him from me he's a baboon. He vows and declares, monsieur, that the other whale, the dried one, is far more deadly than the blasted one. In fine, monsieur, he conjures us, as we value our lives, to cut loose from these fish." Instantly the captain ran forward, and in a loud voice commanded his crew to desist from hoisting the cutting tackles, and at once cast loose the cables and chains confining the whales to the ship. 
"'What now?' said the Guernsey man, when the captain had returned to them. Oh, "'Why, let me see. Yes, you may as well tell him uh, now that, uh, that, in fact, tell him I've diddled him, and, aside to himself, perhaps somebody else. He says, monsieur, that he's very happy to have been of any service to us.' Hearing this, the captain vowed that they were the grateful parties, meaning himself and mate, and concluded by inviting Stubb down into his cabin to drink a bottle of Bordeaux. "'He wants you to take a glass of wine with him,' said the interpreter. Oh, "'Thank him heartily, but tell him it's against my principles to drink with the man I've diddled. In fact, tell him I must go.' "'He says, monsieur, that his principles won't admit of his drinking.' but that if monsieur wants to live another day to drink, then monsieur had best drop all four boats, and pull the ship away from these whales, for it's so calm they won't drift. By this time Stubb was over the side, and getting into his boat, hailed the Guernsey man to this effect, that having a long tow-line in his boat, he would do what he could to help them, by pulling out the lighter whale of the two from the ship's side. While the Frenchman's boats, then, were engaged in towing the ship one way, Stubb benevolently towed away at his whale the other way, ostentatiously slacking out a most unusually long tow-line. Presently a breeze sprang up, Stubb feigned to cast off from the whale, hoisting his boats, the Frenchman soon increased his distance, while the Pequod slid in between him and Stubb's whale whereupon Stubb quickly pulled to the floating body, and hailing the Pequod to give notice of his intentions, at once proceeded to reap the fruit of his unrighteous cunning. Seizing his sharp boat-spade, he commenced an excavation in the body, a little behind the side-fin. You would almost have thought he was digging a cellar there in the sea, and when at length his spade struck against the gaunt ribs, it was like turning up old Roman tiles and pottery buried in fat English loam. His boat's crew were all in high excitement, eagerly helping their chief, and looking as anxious as gold hunters. And all the time numberless fowls were diving and ducking and screaming and yelling and fighting around them, Stubb was beginning to look disappointed, especially as the horrible nosegay increased, when suddenly, from out the very heart of this plague, there stole a faint stream of perfume, which flowed through the tide of bad smells without being absorbed by it, as one river will flow into and then along with another, without at all blending with it for a time. "'I have it! I have it!' cried Stubb with delight striking something in the subterranean regions. A purse! A purse! Dropping his spade, he thrust both hands in, and drew out handfuls of something that looked like ripe Windsor soap, or rich mottled old cheese, very unctuous and savory withal. You might easily dent it with your thumb. It is of a hue between yellow and ash color. And this, good friends, is ambergris, worth a gold guinea an ounce to any druggist. Some six handfuls were obtained, but more was unavoidably lost in the sea, and still more, perhaps, might have been secured were it not for impatient Ahab's loud command to Stubb to desist, and come on board, else the ship would bid them good-bye. End of chapters 89 to 91